Let's turn now to James Sample, a law professor at Hofstra University. Great to have you on the program, James. Now, an Great arraignment you. is just a legal formality, isn't it? Where a judge describes the charges, the defendant enters, enters a plea. When do things really start to heat up? That's a, it's a good question. Today is a perfunctory process. I mean, he's essentially processed and has the opportunity to enter a plea, which, as uh, was indicated, he did enter a plea of not guilty. Uh, but the process is really, at this point, the timing, anyway, is largely up to the former president and his lawyers, which is a little bit counterintuitive because uh, criminal defendants don't have a whole lot of sway in American uh, you know, criminal justice systems, but he does have the right, and he has claimed publicly that he wants a speedy trial, in which case he would be entitled to a trial within the next 70 days. But as was indicated in the prior segment, I don't think there's a chance in the world that he actually, in private and in litigation, will pursue uh, the speedy trial that he wants to claim in the public sphere that he actually desires. And instead, he'll be trying to delay the process at every single turn filing pre-trial motions, evidentiary motions to try and suppress evidence, uh, to try and string this out so that it takes as long as possible uh, to postpone and maybe, um, you know, eventually avoid altogether uh, any actual day of reckoning and justice. You mentioned his lawyers. What's the status on that? I mean, Donald Trump needs to find a legal team to put on his defence. What do you think he needs or will be looking for to best represent his case? So he's got two attorneys who are working with him now, including one who's also on the New York case um, and a former solicitor general in the Florida courts. But what he really needs at this point is a full-time criminal defense counsel who can handle this case almost to the exclusion of everything else. And I think that's one of the reasons that he's struggling to find competent local counsel, because this is a big risk. Attorney Donald Trump churns through attorneys, and many of them, many of the attorneys he's had in the past, including in recent months and years, have found themselves on the wrong side of disciplinary committees in the bar, even on the wrong side of criminal charges. You think about Michael Cohen. He just had two attorneys, two prominent attorneys from his team, resign uh, last week. So I think the challenge is he wants to find somebody who's admitted to practice criminal law in the federal courts in the Southern District of Miami, but also he wants to find uh, somebody who has almost nothing else on their plate. It's hard to find somebody who's both really good and who has the ability to drop everything and work for a, for a client who's notoriously difficult, who sometimes doesn't pay his attorneys, and who often doesn't listen to their counsel. Now, Trump and Norta, his aide and alleged co-conspirator, have been ordered not to discuss the case. Is this quite common for judges to restrict defendants from discussing the facts with a criminal, of a criminal case with witnesses and co-defendants? And given the fact that the two work so closely together, Trump's not known f really for biting his tongue. What could happen if the two men are actually proven to have discussed the case? It's a good question, Sally, and the, the actual answer is that it's going to be hard to prove that, especially since these two individuals are, are with each other constantly. I mean, his, his job title, I mean, is essentially the president's personal aide, his valet, his body man, as it were, um, who gets him his, you know, sodas when he wants a soda, who carries his bags, who keeps track of things, who runs sort of traffic interference with crowds. He's even in the video that you're showing right now, he's just always right there with him. So they spend an awful lot of time together and that makes it very difficult to prevent them from discussing things. Normally, especially where we're talking about co-defendants in a conspiracy uh, case where, where this individual, he's actually a defendant as well, it would be standard practice to advise both of them to stay completely away from each other, not to talk to each other, because this case already has aspects in the indictment of witness tampering. Certainly, um, Donald Trump and his team are going to want to be putting a lot of pressure on his co-defendant, his personal aide, to try and maintain his good graces, because he would be a powerful cooperator if he were to uh, flip and cooperate against uh, the former president. Mm. Now, this is the third court case for the former president now in three months. He's already been indicted in New York and he's under investigation in Georgia for trying to overturn the 2020 election results. Are things closing in on Mr. Trump? 
Certainly, legally speaking, he has more on his plate than just about anyone uh, could imagine. And realistically, we're not done yet. I mean, we've, we went uh, 200 plus years, 250 years, in essence, in a, as a country, um, without having a former president be criminally indicted. We've had that happen now twice in the span of just a couple of months, as the state charges in April in New York and now federal charges in Miami. And, of course, as you reference, he's also uh, found liable um, for the sexual abuse case uh, involving E. Jean Carroll. So that doesn't even scratch the surface of the January 6th litigation that the Department of Justice is looking at in Washington, D.C., and, of course, the Fannie Willis Georgia election interference case, um, which would also be additional state charges. So all of that would be more than enough for most human beings, but to also run for president while juggling those things. Um, Donald Trump is nothing if not unique. No, and I think it's a task he wouldn't mind trying. James Sample, really appreciate your time. Law professor of Hofstra University.